let's suppose tonight that you are taking your wife out for a marvelous date night or if you're single and you have a special one you're taking that person out or if you're single and you want to go by yourself but anyway whoever you are married single you're going to a concert and that concert is in Carnegie Hall in New York City you've looked forward to the concert the London Philharmonic Orchestra is playing and as you sit there enraptured in the music you are just amazed but then somebody in the audience gets up and yells fire fire now you got three choices first you can say this guy is a lunatic I hope somebody carries him out pretty quick or you can say maybe it truly is a fire I'm running for the exit or you can say let's wait and see now to yell fire in a public hall where there is no fire is a very serious thing because somebody can get trampled when they're running to the exit somebody can get so nervous and tense that they can have a heart attack but if there is really a fire wouldn't you want somebody to yell fire wouldn't you want them to yell that as a warning out of love to get out of there alive you see you can look at the yelling fire in two ways you can say why in the world is this guy disrupting my comfort but if there's really a fire that's a message of love isn't it warnings are valid only if the crisis is real if the crisis is not real the warning is not valid at all when we look at the Bible we see a number of warnings that God has given and those warnings that God has given always comes from a heart of love it's always the heart of a God that desires for us to be saved in his kingdom think about the days of Noah did God tell Noah to build an ark because God wanted to destroy the world no God told Noah to build an ark because he wanted to save the world when God gave Noah the blueprint for the ark do you think that was a blueprint for only one ark do you think God would have loved to have hundreds of arks floating on that sea what do you think the message of God came from a God of love because the judgments of God when God withdrew his spirit from the earth were going to fall upon the earth and God gave this warning in love from a loving heart he said in Genesis 6 verse 3 wherever you are let's read it from the screen and reading here together the Lord God said reading together my spirit shall not strive with man forever what does that text actually say it says his spirit is striving then so in the days of Noah God's spirit worked on the hearts of men and women because a loving God wanted to get as many people into the ark as possible so tonight God sends his spirit to your heart wherever you are God's spirit moves to bring us to conviction of sin God's spirit moves to lead us to confession of our sin God's spirit moves to lead us to surrender habits in our life that are not in harmony with his will why because he loves us he wants us in the ark of safety we are living at a time very similar to the times of Noah Genesis 6 verse 5 says then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth is the wickedness of human beings great in the earth tonight would you say that and every intent of the thoughts of his heart was evil continually so we live in an age of crime and violence we live in an age of immorality we live in an age of dishonesty we live in an age when pornography reigns we live in an age where there's a confusion of sex roles and gender roles we live in an age similar to the days of Noah and God is saying there is a warning in love that's coming to the world and God's final warning is in the book of Revelation now when you study the book of Revelation some people say well Revelation is a book that's closed it's a book of beasts and cryptic symbols and you can't understand it but wait a minute what does the word Revelation mean is something that is revealed is that something that's closed or is it something that's open so this is the book what's the name of this book that we're studying Revelation now in Revelation 1 verse 1 it says the revelation of who who's this a revelation of Jesus Christ and what does Jesus want to do it's the revelation of Jesus 
And where did Jesus get this revelation? God gave it to him. Why did he give it to him? To show his servants things much, much shortly come to pass. So the book of Revelation comes to us directly from God. When I take my Bible and when I open it to Revelation, I open it with a sacred awe. I open it with, with a sacred sense that God gave the book of Revelation to Jesus. Jesus gave it to the angel, and the angel brought it in vision to John, and John wrote it down. So when I pick up the book of Revelation, I'm picking up a book that came from God to Jesus, down to the angel, a book that God gave to John so he would write it down for you and me. And when I read the prophecies of Revelation, I'm thinking, this is Jesus' end time message to us. Now, in this book of Revelation, we have the cosmic conflict between good and evil revealed. In the book of Revelation, Christ reveals what's going to take place. The heart of the book of Revelation, and this comes in the last book's message called the message of the three angels. Now, why does God call that message of the message of three angels? Because when John looks up into heaven, he sees three angels flying in the middle of heaven. And these messages of the three angels in Revelation, these messages are God's last day message to humanity. So in Revelation 14, verse 6, we read, and let's read it together from the screen. Wherever you are, read with us. You're in your home, join us. You're part of the, the audience. If you're in a church, join us. And here in West Houston, let's read it together. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell upon the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Now notice, I saw another angel floating in the midst of heaven. Is that what the text says? I saw another angel doing what? Flying in the midst of heaven. So here is a message that's urgent. The angel does not float, the angel flies. It's an urgent message. Secondly, it's an eternal message. It's the everlasting gospel. And thirdly, it's a universal message. So here is a message that is so important that it's urgent. Here's a message that's so important that it's eternal. It speaks to every generation in every age, every culture, every country. And here's a message that's to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So in this message of the three angels, God sends a message that is urgent. He sends a message that's eternal. But he sends a message to every nation, every kindred, every tongue, and every people. It is the message of the everlasting or the eternal gospel. So to understand this message, you have to understand the gospel. Because the gospel is the foundation of this message, this end time message that comes from, from Jesus. The gospel is that ark of refuge that's to take us through the coming crisis. The gospel is that fort that protects us from the attacks of the enemy. The gospel is that place where we can come and find hope in the last days. What is the gospel? There are three areas of the gospel. First, we are justified freely by the grace of Jesus Christ. When we come to Jesus, he pardons our past. When we come to Jesus, he frees us from condemnation. Secondly, the gospel is the grace. It's a declaration that God is righteous, and we come as unrighteous, and Jesus clothes us with his righteousness. Thirdly, the gospel is the grace that God justifies those who believe in Jesus. So when we come to Jesus, we stand before God just as if we've never sinned. One night, I was preaching in Moscow in the Kremlin Auditorium. This is the place where the Communist Party had their meetings for many years. This is the place that no Christian could ever enter. In fact, the leader of our work in Russia, Mikhail Kulikov, told me, he said, when when we told our members, as they walked by the Kremlin, don't even look too long because the authorities may think that you have some evil intention and they would arrest you. Who would ever think? that a Seventh-day Adventist preacher 
could walk onto the stage in the Kremlin and stand on the very platform that Andropov spoke from and Chernenko spoke from and Yeltsin spoke from and Gorbachev spoke from and, and Yeltsin spoke from. Who could ever think that? But in the divine providence of God, in that unique moment of history, 1992, when communists had just fallen, I was able to walk into that platform. The auditorium sat 6,500 people, and it was an amazing auditorium, 14 escalators in the, the, the essence of opulence. We filled it the first session, filled it the second session. 13,000 people came every night to hear the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. They had been denied for 40 years, but now they came to the Kremlin Auditorium. Between each session, I would go in and eat a little Russian borscht, like a Russian soup, to get enough strength to preach in the second session. Because when you're preaching to 6,500 people, and they're atheists, they have no religious background, and you're trying to make the gospel plain. Well, between sessions, I'm sitting in the back eating this little Russian borscht, and a Russian man rushes in, long hair, deeply scars on his face, and he's yelling. Now, when somebody yells in a foreign language, and you don't know what they're yelling. I didn't know if the guy was going to attack me and pull a knife out of his pocket or what. And this guy's yelling. So my translator jumped up and got between us, but he's yelling, you talked about Jesus. I want Jesus. I want to find Jesus. Mister, help me find Jesus. We sat and we talked together. We talked about the Christ that came, tabernacled in human flesh. The Christ that came and lived the life that we should have lived. The Christ that came and died the death we should have died. The Christ that came to give us a new heart. That he would forgive our sins. That he would take the guilt off our shoulder. That we could be new in Christ. This man was called the thief of Moscow. He was in and out of courts about 28 times. He had scars on his face from knife fights in the street. But that night he knelt with tears in his eyes saying, Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, give me a new life. About a year later, I came back to Moscow and we were in one of the churches. We raised up 12 new churches, planted 12 new churches in Moscow in those meetings. And I was at one of the churches sitting with my host and my host said to me, Pastor Mark, you're going to love this. And the choir walked on the stage 25, 30 people, beautiful Russian choirs, great music. And the, my host said to me, every one of the people in that choir was baptized in your last series of meetings in the Kremlin. And I was just thrilled, you know. And uh, so there was one man, sparkle in his eyes, clean shaven, and, and he just sparkling, and he was singing with all his heart. And I said, who's that man? Who's that man? You don't know? He's the thief of Moscow. <laughs> That note gave his life to Jesus. The book of Revelation is all about Jesus. I don't know where you are in your Christian experience tonight. I don't know where you are watching. But there's somebody watching tonight that you need forgiveness. You need grace. There's somebody sitting here in this audience that you know this week was not a good week for you. You lost your temper with your wife. You were watching stuff on the internet that you know is not in harmony with God's will. You know the truth about the Bible Sabbath, but you are breaking it. You know that you ought to be faithful in your tithe, but you're not doing it. There's somebody here tonight in this auditorium. There's somebody watching that you need grace tonight. And the good news is that whoever you are, you can bow your head and say, Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, give me that new life. That's the Christ of the book of Revelation. The Bible says in Romans 5, verse 6 and 8, for when we were still without strength, we were without what, everybody? Strength. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man. But here's the good news. Someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ did not die because we were righteous. He died to make us righteous. Christ did not die because we were, we were without sin. He died because we were a sin. Jesus says to you and me tonight, 
I am your Savior. You can come to me with all of your weakness and all your sin and all your folly. Christ's grace is unmerited. What does that mean? It means we don't deserve it. Christ's grace is undeserved. We don't deserve it. Christ's grace is unearned. We can't earn the grace of Christ. When we come to Jesus, what does he do? He delivers us from the penalty of sin. He delivers us from the power of sin. And finally, he will come again and deliver us from sin's presence. That's the Christ of the book of Revelation. The Jesus of Revelation delivers us from sin's penalty. We don't have to live condemned anymore. But he also delivers us from sin's power. We're not caught in the grip of sin. We may fall, but sin never reigns in our life again. But one day Jesus is going to come, and he's going to deliver us from sin's presence. Revelation 14, 6 says, Then I saw another angel flying in the middle of heaven with the everlasting gospel, the good news to preach to every, those that dwell upon the earth, to every nation, tongue, and people. The gospel is going to go to the ends of the earth before Jesus comes. This prophecy will be fulfilled. You know, I've preached now in over 100 countries in the world, and I have so many memories. The only good thing about getting old is you've got a lot of memories. You know how you know you're getting old? When you bend down to tie your shoe and you say, what else can I do when I'm down here? You see, that? that's how you know you're getting old. You got so many aches and pains, you, haven't even, you never even knew where the, 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 those muscles existed in your body. But one thing about getting old, you got a lot of memories. One night, I'm in the Philippines. How many Filipinos I got here? You disappointed me tonight. You didn't bring me any lupia panza. <laughs> I, I thought at least my Filipino brothers and sisters in Houston be hospitable and bring me lupia and panset, but I didn't get any tonight. But I got some Indian food from Dr. Yeah, Dr. Ovi. He brought me Indian food tonight. Look, I was way up in the in jungles in the Philippines on a dirt road. I was preaching on a dirt road way back in the mountains. And um, as I was way back in their mountains, there was, a, there was a wooden table we set up with a little lantern on it. And I was talking about Jesus and his grace. And I had these little kids, they were sitting in the front, and I'm thinking, how can I ever illustrate that Christ's grace is free? And I had something in my pocket, a pan, a comb or something. So I walked down to one of these little Filipino kids, and I said, I have this for you, take it. And the kid saw this big, skinny, tall American, and he got so afraid, he ran into the jungle. I went to the next kid. Here, take this. It's yours. It's a gift. I want to give it to you. He got so scared, he jumped up, ran in the jungle. The third kid took it out of my hand, yanked it, and ran away. So I began yelling, and their parents began yelling, come back, come back. And so they all came back, and I said, now, to the first kid, do you have the pen or the comb? Do you have it? He said, no, I don't have it. Why don't you have it? I didn't take it. Do you have it? No, I don't have it. Why don't you have it? I didn't take it. I said, third kid, do you have it? He said, oh, yeah, I got it, I got it. I said, it's yours, it's a gift. He got eyes big. I said to the other two kids, why does he have it, and why don't you have it? He has it because he took it. And I said to the audience, did you take the gift of salvation in Jesus? It's yours. It's yours. Whoever you are, reach out and take it. Salvation is yours. You accept it by faith tonight. It's to go to all the world. Recently, I came from Kenya, Nairobi, preaching 20,000 downlinks there and seeing thousands of people come. Pakistan watching them come, China, Nanjing. I will tell you something. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the truths of the book of Revelation are going to the ends of the earth tonight. What did Jesus say in Matthew 24, verse 14? This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness to how many nations? All the nations. Then the end shall come. Look, if I can stand here in Houston, and a 13-year-old girl in China can hear me. This prophecy is being fulfilled before your eyes. What do you say, church? If we can stand here tonight and through internet, the gospel breaks every barrier. Not long ago, I sat in my office in Virginia and I preached evangelistic meetings for China, and 10 million Chinese around the world downlinked it. That's a miracle. You see, totalitarian regimes cannot stop the gospel from going forth today. It leaps across geographical boundaries. It's going throughout all the Middle East. 
God is doing some amazing things today. This prophecy of three angels flying in the middle of heaven. The message flies. We are here. Within seconds, they hear it around the world today. God is preparing for the finishing of His work today. The gospel is going to the ends of the earth. Revelation 14 verse 6 says, Fear God, give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him that made heaven, earth, and the springs of water. So let's look at this. Remember verse 6 said, I saw another angel doing what? What's the angel doing? Flying. Where? In the midst of heaven. What was he carrying? The everlasting gospel. And where was the gospel to go? To the ends of the earth. But then, God has a special message in the context of the gospel that was not understood by general Christians. He says in verse 7, fear God, give glory to him. Why? Because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven, earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Fear God, give glory to him. The hour of his judgment not will come, but it has come. In other words, at the time of the fulfillment of Revelation's prophecies, we would be living in the judgment hour just before the coming of Jesus. And it's a call to fear God. What does it mean to fear God? Does it mean to shake? It means to quake? What, what is fearing God? What does it mean to fear God and how do we fear God? The word for fear there is an interesting Greek word of the New Testament. It's called phoebo. And it's in the sense of giving reverence to God. It's in the sense of giving awe to God. It's a sense of respecting God, but it's much deeper than reverence, awe, or respect in the original language. It is a, what does phoebo mean? It means a state of mind in which I take God seriously. A state of mind in which I take God seriously. Fear God is respecting God. It means you're living a God-centered life rather than a self-centered life. So there is a call at end time. There's a call in the final generation to live a life on planet Earth to live not self-centered life but in the light of the judgment, to live a God-centered life. We discover the depth of the meaning of this expression, fear God, by observing how this expression, fear God, is used in other places in the Bible. And so we look there. Deuteronomy 6, verse 2. Read it with me together. Fear the Lord your God to keep all his commandments in statutes which I command you. So, fearing God is a state of mind in which I take Him seriously and I respect Him enough to obey Him and keep His commandments. Here's another text, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Do what? Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is man's all. So, fear God. So, there's a message that would go out to an end-time generation that the commandments of God are still relevant. In an age when we saturate our lives with other gods, God says, thou shalt not have any other gods before me. In an age when we make images of sports stars, when we make icons of Hollywood stars, in a, in a time God says, you shall have no other gods before me. When materialism becomes our God, when clothes becomes our God, when our car becomes our God, when power becomes our God, when prestige becomes our God, God says, you shall have no other gods before me. The Ten Commandments still speak with relevance. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Don't profess to be a Christian and go home and yell at your wife. That's taking the Lord thy God in vain. Don't say, I love Jesus, and then go home and, and use your money the way you want to do that. That's taking God's name in vain. See, what does the commandment mean that says, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain? It means do not. Certainly, it has to do with cursing and swearing, but it's much deeper than that. It is do not profess to be one thing and live another way. That's taking God's name in vain. Don't come to church on Sabbath morning and then go watch pornography at night. That's taking God's name in vain. That's professing something that you are not. See, these commandments speak with relevance. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. How do I reverence God? How do I take him seriously? By remembering that he created me. And every Sabbath coming to worship him as my creator. Not accepting a human substitute for the Bible Sabbath. What about the commandment that says, 
honor your father and your mother. What about the commandment that says, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. These commandments speak to us. So Revelation 14, 7, that says, fear God, has to do with an appeal to keep the commandments of God. Why? Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13, God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing. So the grace of God that pardons us leads us to obey God's commandments. In the light of the judgment hour, heaven's urgent appeal are for those saved by grace to live godly lives. The gospel not only delivers us from the guilt of our past, but it empowers us, it changes us. We come to Christ just as we are, but we do not stay as we are, church. It empowers us to live godly, obedient lives. Romans 1, verse 15, read it with me, please. We have received, what have we received, everybody? Grace and apostleship for what? Obedience to the faith of all the nations. God's speaking to somebody here tonight. Somebody who feels convicted by the Holy Spirit that you have not been living in harmony with God's law. Maybe you've not been honest. Maybe you've not been pure. Maybe you've been violating God's Sabbath, but you've been coming to meetings and you now understand that the seventh day of the week is the Bible's Sabbath, and you hear the call of God to your heart. You've received grace and apostleship for obedience in the light of the judgment hour. By God's grace, He will give you the strength to obey. By God's grace, He will empower you to keep the commandments of God and the faith among all nations. You know, in a book that I love called Christ Triumphant, it says this on page 235, those who are truly converted to Christ must keep on constant guard lest they accept error in the place of truth. I don't want to accept error in the place of truth, do you? Now notice this next sentence, it's powerful. Those who think it matters not what they believe in doctrine, so long as they believe in Jesus Christ, are on dangerous ground. I don't want to be on dangerous ground, do you? See, when we come to Jesus, what is doctrine? Doctrines are the teachings of Christ. So if I come to Jesus, I want to accept Jesus' teachings, don't I? I want to accept his teachings about the second coming and not some false teaching about the secret rapture. I want to accept the teachings that Jesus is coming visibly so every eye will see him and every ear will hear it. I want to accept Jesus' teachings about obedience to his law, accept his teachings about the Sabbath, accept his teachings about death. So when we come to Jesus, we come to accept Jesus' teachings. Christ is the embodiment of all true doctrine, and Christ is the embodiment of the teachings that he's given in Scripture. Now, there's a, a theologian by the name of Andrew Bonar, and this is what he said. Instant obedience is the only kind of obedience there is. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Whoever strives to withdraw from obedience withdraws from grace. So there's somebody tonight listening, somebody here. God is leading you to take another step. God is leading you to make some decision for Christ. He's leading you to be an obedient follower. Bonar says this, it's not the importance of the thing, but the majesty of the lawgiver. That is to be the standard of obedience. Some indeed might reckon such minute and arbitrary rules as trifling. Was it trifling when God said to Eve, don't partake of the tree? Wasn't that a very small thing? Was the issue Eve reaching out and partaking of the tree? Was that the issue? What was the issue? The issue was the disobedience of God. So somebody says, what difference does a day make? The difference that it makes is that God wrote the Ten Commandments with, table, with his finger on tables of stone. That's the difference. So it's not trifling, it's, it's a principle. But the principle involved in obedience or disobedience was none other than the same principle which was tried in Eden at the foot of the forbidden tree. It's really this. Is the Lord to be obeyed in all things? That's the question. Notice, whatsoever he commands, is he a holy lawgiver or 
are his creatures bound to give implicit assent to his will? When God wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger on tables of stone, and when he sends a message in the book of Revelation to an end-time generation, fear, respect God, take him seriously, keep his commandments, do you think it's important for us to do that? Do you think that? Certainly. An urgent appeal in the light of heaven's judgment hour is found in Revelation to make God the center of our lives. And we make him the center of our lives through obeying him. You know, everybody has some center in their life. Some people, the center of their life is money. Some people, the center of their life is entertainment. Some people, the center of their life is sports. Some people, the center of their life is parties. But what does Jesus say? Matthew 6, verse 33. Can you read it with me, please? Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. When we put Jesus first in our life, he brings a new joy to us. He brings a new peace to us. He brings a new sense of, of satisfaction to us. When secular values have made self the center, heaven's appeal and revelation is to turn from the tyranny of self-centeredness and the bondage of self-inflated importance to place God at the center of our lives. What do you say? Now, what does it mean to give glory to God? We've studied what it means to fear God. It means to take God seriously. We've studied what it means to fear God. It means to receive the grace for obedience. What does it mean to give glory to God? Fearing God has to do what we think. Fearing God has to do with a state of mind. Giving glory to God has to do what we do in our lives. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31 says, Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. In other words, God is leading an end-time people to say, Lord, whatever I look at, I want, it to be, I want my eyes to be sanctified. Whatever I hear, I want to let into my ears only that which is sanctified. Whatever I take into my mouth, Lord, you created this body of mine. I don't want to defile it. So heaven's end time message of giving glory to God is a message of physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual wholeness. God's end time message calls an end time people to be healthy. It calls them from the destroying practices of our world. Notice what Paul says in Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech, that is, I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you can never consecrate your body to God unless you do it by the mercies of God, by the grace of God. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God. Seventh-day Adventists are not interested in health simply because we believe that following the health message will help us live 8, 10, 12 years longer. We want that. We want good health. But we're interested in health because we recognize that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, that God created it. We're interested in health because we want to care for the creation that God gave us. We're interested in health also because we recognize that God communicates to us through the mind. And if we eat a poor quality of food and the blood is clogged that brings the oxygen to the brain, that we will thus not be able to discern the delicate movings of the Holy Spirit on the brain. So Paul says, I beseech you therefore, my brothers and my sisters, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. This is part of an end-time message to prepare a people for the coming of Jesus. Now, the New Testament Greek word there for bodies is interesting. It is sumata. If you were guessing what the word sumata means, what would you guess? What are the first three letters? Some, some. So this word means totality. So what Paul is saying here is, I beseech you, I urge you, that you present the totality of your being, everything you are, physically, mentally, spiritually, to Jesus. The collective sum of the body, mind, and emotions to Jesus, which is your reasonable service. Philip's translation says it's an intelligent act of worship. So when I come to Christ and I say, Jesus, 
I'm giving up alcohol. I'm giving up tobacco. When you come to Christ and you say, Jesus, I'm giving up anything harmful for my body. I'm giving up the unhealthful drugs that uh, I, I'm giving that up. I'm giving up pork. I'm, I'm, I surrender my life to you, Lord. I want to eat and drink only in harmony with your will. I'm giving up anything. That's an intelligent act of worship. See, it's, it's part of a last day message. What's our last day message? I saw another angel do what? Flying. It's an urgent message. In the midst of heaven, with the everlasting gospel of good news of God's grace, to the ends of the earth, saying, fear God, take Him seriously, obey Him. Give Him glory in the way you live, in what you see, in what you hear. Give Him glory by being obedient to Him. Present your body as a living sacrifice. Place your body on the altar of sacrifice. Say, God, I don't want to take into anything into my body that's going to destroy this marvelous creation that you have given to me. We give glory to God as we reveal His character to the world through the lives that we live in doing His will. Revelation's end time message speaks to us. It says, I saw another angel flying with the everlasting gospel, to preach them that dwell upon the earth, saying with a loud voice, fear God, obey him, keep his commandments, the, give glory to him in the way you live. Why? Because the hour of his judgment has come. We are living in a unique time of earth's history. We're living in the final judgment hours of earth's history. The sands in the hourglass of time are running out one night. Elder H.M.S. Richards of the Voice of Prophecy was preaching a powerful sermon on the signs of Christ's coming. And an old man in the audience stood up. He shook his finger at Elder Richards. And he said, Pastor, Christ might not come for another hundred years. Richards said to that man, Sir, please put your hand on your heart. Thump, 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 thump. Judging by your age, sir, it's not going to be a hundred years for you. <laughs> because when you close your eyes in death, the next thing you're going to see is the coming of Christ. You know, I was preaching down in, in Brazil, Coritiba, passed out the response cards. Young man who had drifted away from Christ filled out his response card. He had been involved in the drug world. He was actually a drug dealer. But he gave his life to Christ. He had been coming to the Adventist church. He had, he had drifted away, but he came back. And he was so excited about his decision for baptism that he checked on the response card that he, he wanted to show it to his mom, who was a faithful Adventist. He was married. His mom was living in a different apartment, and he went home that night. But he hadn't paid off some of the dr drug lords that he was dealing with, and he owed them money. When he went to go into his house that night, a car came by and shot him and shot him to death. That very night of my meeting. When the funeral took place, his mama found the decision card in his pocket. And she said at the funeral, she took out that decision card from her dead son, and she said, thank God, thank God, he did not hesitate. Thank God that I'll see my son again in eternity. The hour of God's judgment has come. I cannot tell you when Christ is going to come, but I can tell you this, you and I are one heartbeat away from the coming of Jesus. The hour of God's judgment has come. This unique time in earth's history, not only is there a judgment going on in heaven right now, but every one of us, by the decisions we make in life, it's the judgment hour. If you're hesitating to be all out for Christ, this is the time to do it. You see, in the final judgment, it's not how many good deeds did you commit and how many bad deeds you could commit. In the final judgment is, did this man, this woman, fully give their life to Christ? You remember what Revelation 14, 7 says? The hour of God's judgment has come. The hour of whose judgment? God's judgment. God is on trial before the universe. Satan has said he's unfair, he's unjust, he's a dictator. 
He, he has rules that are impossible to obey. This is the of God's judgment, but in the judgment, when 10,000 times 10,000 gather there at the judgment seat of God, and Christ steps forth, and names come up in judgment, Jesus says, could I have done anything more to save John, to save Mary, to save, ha to save Harry, to save Janet? I sent my angels to beat back the forces of hell in their mind. I did everything I could to save them. I arranged providences in their life. I brought them to meetings like this. Jesus stands before the universe with wounded hands, and he says, what else could I have done? My, I wanted to save them. I revealed myself in the natu natural world to them. I came to die on the cross. I've given them opportunity after opportunity and the whole universe falls and says in Revelation 15, 3, great and marvelous are your works, O Lord, God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of kings. The whole universe bows and says you did everything you could. You couldn't have done anything more to save John, to save Mary. The incredible good news is that the cross is sufficient. The incredible good news is the love of God is sufficient. The incredible good news is the power of God is sufficient. The Apostle Paul calls us out of the pettiness of our self-made worlds to the largeness of the world that Christ came to redeem. We're living in the judgment hour. Christ is inviting you to make decision for him. You know, some people pour out their lives in their work. Some people pour out their lives in sports. Some people pour out their lives in pleasure and entertainment. Some people pour out their lives in time-consuming, all-absorbing, mind-numbing digital devices. Every one of us is going to pour out our life in something. But God is going to have a group of people at end time that are passionate about Jesus. And they pour out their lives to serve Jesus. We're all pouring out our lives for something. You know, Revelation speaks about a group of people at end time that by his grace and through his grace and because of his grace, they are indeed redeemed. These believers overcome. And there are believers in every generation that overcome. At the end of time, those who overcome will inherit all things. Grace is greater than sin. Christ is greater than the evil one. The power of God is greater than the power of evil. Revelation 14, 12 says, Here are those that keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. Do you want to be part of that group tonight? Jesus says, you can be. We overcome not because of who we are, but because of who he is. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, verse 14 to 16, seeing then that we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. We never give up. Why not? Because the Christ that died for us is the Christ that lives for us. The lamb that died is the priest that lives. We can hold on. Why? Because we know that our Jesus is in heaven and that he will grant to us the power, the strength. It says, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. He knows we are weak, so he'll give us strength. But was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Whatever you go through tonight, he has gone through. Let us therefore. Let us do what? Therefore. What is the therefore, therefore? What is the therefore, therefore? Let us do what? Therefore. In other words, because we have a high priest, because he was tempted like we are, because he is, his, his grace is ours, because he is all-powerful, let us therefore come boldly, that means confidently, to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Do you have a time of need tonight? Is there a time of need with your children? Is there a time of need in your family? Is there a time of need in your marriage? Is there a time of need in your health? Is there a time of need in your finances? Is there a time of need with something you're struggling with tonight? Let us come confidently 
boldly to the throne of grace that we can find mercy for the way we've failed and we can find grace to help in time of need. Jesus in Gethsemane suffered for you. Jesus on the cross suffered for you. Jesus on the cross died for you. Jesus on the cross lives for you. Without Christ's example, we have no ideal with how to live. But his life on earth is our example. Without Christ's death, we have no forgiveness. But because he died, we can be forgiven. Without Christ's resurrection, we have no hope. The earth, the, the, the grave is just a dark hole in the ground. Without Christ's intercession, we have no power. If Christ died and he was never resurrected and never ascended to heaven, he's a martyr dying for a good cause. That's all. But he died. And hallelujah, he's resurrected from the dead. He lives. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. And because he lives, he can give us power and strength. Without Christ's mediation, we have no favor with God. But Jesus stands before the whole universe and he says, these are one of mine. These are my sons, my daughters. Grant them a place in the eternal kingdom. Without Christ's daily presence, we have no assurance or victory. We cannot have strength on our own. Without Christ's promise of his return, we have no confidence of a better tomorrow. But one day, sin and sorrow and suffering will be over. One day, disease and death will be over. One day, chaos and calamity will be over. One day, poverty and pollution and pestilence will be over. One day, war and worry and want will be no more. They will be over. One day, Jesus will come and Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are what? Many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, Jesus says, and I will come again. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Tis so sweet to just take him by his word. Would you like to say Jesus tonight? I want to trust you. I want to trust you. Take your card out just now. Spend a moment filling it out. And as Laura comes to sing this song, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus, let me tell you a little bit about that song. That song, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus, wherever you are, wherever you are in the church, take your card out. Special time in our meetings. You have a chance to respond to Jesus. You may be a church member. You may not be, but there's something that's on the card for you. If you're watching at home, participate with us. Don't get up and go get a cup of herbal tea right now. Let God speak to you right now at home. Let God speak to you. As you take this card, take, take just a, um, a screenshot of it or, or follow it on, uh, get the link to it and uh, follow along. Look, the song, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus, written by Laura Steed. Laura Steed was born in 1850 in, in England. She came with her husband to the United States, immigrants to America. Eventually, they ended up in New York City. And they were not a very wealthy couple at all. They had very, very little. But one day, Laura and her husband and their daughter decided to go out to Long Island, Long Island Sound. They were going to have a picnic on the ocean. They spread their blanket out, got all the food ready, and as they did, they saw a young man, a teenager, out there swimming who was drowning. And Laura's husband went out and he said, Honey, I'm gonna, I can help that young man. I know how to swim. And as he swam out to help the young man, the young man put his hands around his neck and both of them drowned. Laura Steed's husband drowned before her very eyes as she and her young daughter watched. Now imagine... You're an immigrant to the United States. You have very, very little. You're living in a country that you don't know well. You're living in a little apartment, crowded tenement in New York City. And you don't have much. And your husband drowns before your eyes. Running out of what money? Running out of food? 
Laura sat there at the table that day with her daughter. She was about hopeless. She said to her daughter, let's go for a walk in the park. She opened the door, and there was a box of food. She came in with tears coming down her face. She began to write these timeless words, these words that have touched countless generations, these words that have given hope to the hopeless. She began to write, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus." Just to take him at his word. Just to believe his promise. You can make a decision tonight. Wherever you are in the realm of faith, to trust deeply in Jesus. If you haven't done it yet, take out a pen. The first line says, I believe salvation comes only by grace through faith. If you believe that tonight, maybe you've affirmed it before, but check that box tonight. Secondly, I accept the forgiveness Jesus freely offers and believe he desires me to live a life free from destruction and guilt. If you believe that, check that. Third box, I choose to respond to his life by living a life of commitment and obedience to his will. Maybe you've not been keeping the commandments of God. Maybe the Sabbath is new to you. Maybe you've been abusing your body, taking substances in. But tonight, you sense he'll forgive you and give you the power. Check that third box. Fourth box, I've never been baptized by immersion. Maybe you've never gone under the water. Maybe you've never found the peace that only Christ can give. Check that box. And it says, I desire to be baptized, or I've wandered away and desire rebaptism. You're sitting here tonight at West Houston Church. And maybe you've drifted away. Nobody else knows it but you. But you're checking that box and saying, Pastor, I want to talk to you about rebaptism. Something happened in my past. I've really drifted. I've never made it right with God. Maybe you're watching online. Maybe you're in your home. You've downloaded the decision card. Maybe you're in a church. You want to look for the joy. You want the past to be the past. You want new life in Christ. We're having wonderful baptism here in the morning, tomorrow, tomorrow in the afternoon. Many are going to come. Churches all through Texas are having baptisms. But maybe you're not in Texas. Maybe you are in China. Maybe you are in Australia. But you want to participate and say, look, I want to follow Jesus in baptism. Let us know. We'll contact your local church. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Listen as Laura sings. And after the song, I'm going to come down to the front Right after the song, the ushers will collect the cards. But listen to the words of the song and let them be the prayer of your heart. Just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the said the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust in Need the healing, cleansing blood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. How I've proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Oh, for grace to trust him.
I'm so glad to trust him. Precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that thou art with me, will be with me through the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. How I've proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Oh, for grace to trust him. Amen, amen. Jesus loves to have us come to him just as we are, to trust him. Ushers, you can collect the cards just now. Jesus loves it when we come with all of our weakness, with all of our frailty. And we come to receive his strength. Wherever you are now, pastors, you can collect the cards, ushers, you can and then they'll bring the cards to me, and I'm going to pray over them. Jesus knows every name. He knows every decision. We write something down here, and people say to me, Pastor Mark, why do you have us fill out a card? Because the simple act of filling out the card strengthens our own faith. And as the mind fills out that card and makes a decision, we open our hearts and minds to the influence of the Holy Spirit. And so filling out a card is not simply some mechanical, ritualistic thing, but it's really opening the heart to God. It's letting God speak to our hearts, letting God speak to our minds. And then as I pray over the cards, we give them to our pastors. They pray over them. And so by filling out that card, you, have, you know that you have people praying for you. They're uplifting you. They're strengthening. Their prayers will be a strengthening time for you. As they're collecting the cards, come on up, Laura, and we're going to sing. Laura, we're going to sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus Again. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. Do you know that one? I know Michelle can play that one. We did that last night, right? This is becoming kind of our theme song. Let's sing it together. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the thing will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Not sure if you can bring me up the cards just now. Thank you so much. We're going to pray over these cards. And let's bow our heads together. Father in heaven, you know every name on every card. You who numbered the hairs of our head. You who named every star, every planet, have not, has not forgotten 
our name. You know us by name. You know the challenges we face. You know the struggles we go through. You know the mountains that we stand on and praise you and thank you. You also know the decisions that are before us tonight. And I pray especially for somebody here going through a great trial or challenge. Be with them. Help them to know that you are there in the heavenly sanctuary as the great high priest. That you are there to give them strength and courage. I pray too for somebody that needs to make a decision. Over this special Sabbath, may there be scores of decisions for eternity made for Jesus. And Father, tonight, we just thank you with all of our hearts for Jesus. Bring us back tomorrow for another powerful service in your word. In Christ's name, amen.